I dedicate this presentation to my grandparents, Mary Elizabeth Addie Stewart Gwynn and the late James Walter Gwynn. Questions about their journey and their joy in learning the answers are what has led me here and kept me here. My grandmother just turned 101 two days ago. My work involves going to search on digital sites like Ancestry.com and Family Search, but also visiting archives in many states, reading microfilm machines that look like this, traveling to historic sites where my ancestors were enslaved, and visiting with the elders. This is my grandmother with her aunt who lived to be 101. This collage shows the ancestors for whom I have photos. The largest portion of my DNA matches people from Nigeria at 18%. My mother's side of the family brings me most of my English, Irish, and German ancestry, but a great deal of that also comes from people who enslaved my ancestors. This is a family tree showing my dad's ancestors. Gray boxes represent enslavers who have been either named in documents or whom have been identified through DNA matches to their descendants. It shows more graphically how light skin is evidence of the rape of my foremothers. The diversity of my family includes Frederick Duquette, an early black priest who founded a parish in Flint, Michigan, James Monroe Jameson, the first doctor to graduate from a Harry Medical School, Rex Stewart, a cornet player in Duke Ellington's band, and this lovely woman who I don't know, but her picture was with ours, so I claim her as a cousin. Newspaper obituary. Aunt Patsy Porter, colored, died after a comparatively short illness at the home of her daughter, Aunt Esther Brown. Two days later, practically all of the best colored people for miles around, together with very many of the best whites, assembled here to attend the burial. Aunt Patsy was born in June 1819 and was almost 106 years old. Phoebe Sales and Charles Sales, my great, great, great grandparents. Phoebe's obituary said, she was a loving wife and a faithful mother. She bore her suffering with patience, and there was nothing between her and God. Samuel Mason was born in 1820, and his family was part of the Oxidoster movement, leaving their homes in Tennessee to relocate to Topeka, Kansas. They included a lawyer, a doctor, and a woman's relief wor worker, and my great-great-grandmother, who we called Nanny Mason. This is Nanny's sister, Pearl Mason, with her cousin, Jeanette, next to a painting that Pearl made. I love to think of her imagining this palm tree and perhaps having it framed in her room and having the spirit to make art. Addie Jane Johnson Stewart was my gr grandmother's mother, born in 1894, who'd lived to be only 25 and died after giving birth to my grandmother. Two of her sisters lived to be over 100. I, it makes me sad to think of the lost potential. Mary Eliza Mason Stewart, nanny, raised a son as a single mother, although she later remarried her former husband before a second divorce. She moved from Prickle, Cripple Creek, Colorado, to Topeka, Kansas, then Nebraska, then Newark, New Jersey. But she and her sisters all traveled well into their old age. Mother Stewart was not only a good mother to her son, but she was also a good mother to her oldest granddaughter, Elizabeth Gwim, who sh whom she reared from birth as her own daughter. She carried out a promise that she had made to a dying mother, and she did it very well. Nanny also took Grandma to Kansas to meet her cousins and to Virginia to her mother's people regularly. That's the reason I was able to build such close relationships with my cousins who still live in the area. This photo shows my grandmother's aunt in the center on the left, and the photo on the right shows my grandmother on the left with her two grandmothers. When I think about Nanny and all the work she, do, she did, I think of the grind. She attended a beauty school so she could work as a licensed hairdresser. She ran a tea room and bingo, par bingo parlor. She took in mending and sewed aprons, and she sold black ebony Christmas cards to her neighbors door to door. My great-great-grandfather, Robert Stewart, AKA Reginald Stewart, is described this way in a clipping in his son's scrapbook. His father is a great businessman. He's well known 
a Western man, and of course his spirit of doing great things and his ability and all of his qualifications and activities have been handed down to his son, Sylvester. Reginald, my great-great-grandfather on the left, is originally from Virginia, but his family was brought to Missouri as slaves. Reginald's son, Rex, wrote in his book, Jazz Masters of the 30s, that Reginald played violin, mandolin, and piano, in addition to singing in a quartet. Samuel F Sylvester Stewart, my great-grandfather, was a World War I vet, a businessman, and a politician, the father of my grandmother and five other children. He worked for the mayor of Newark and also ran for city council. And this is a piece of art that he made, featuring a poem called Heart and Home. He also painted many oils and watercolor paints and exhibited his art at the Newark Museum in New Jersey. I love to think of artwork made by my family displayed around their home, and I'm so grateful to have it. This is Nanny at her sewing machine with photos of a reproduced quilt that I made by having her quilt printed as a design on a new piece of fabric. I made this for my cousin who was undergoing cancer treatments so she could be wrapped up in family love. I don't know the ratio of nature to nurture that makes up our beings, how much comes from our ancestors and how much comes from the journeys we have taken ourselves, but I'm grateful for the creative sparks that flew th from them and through me.